Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank the witnesses for their um, patience with us today. There's just so much to go over. Uh, let me just talk quickly about what I think we've learned today. One is a deep concern expressed by just about every member of this panel, Democrat and Republican, about the lack of a plan in place to properly address the surge of migrants who will certainly uh, be coming over the border uh, when Title 42 ends. That's, uh, I think, a consensus point. Second, an acknowledgement that the asylum process is totally broken and that it acts as a magnet uh, to draw people to the border and over the border. Uh, here are the numbers. Um, Secretary Mayorkas tells us the average asylum case processing time is six to eight years. We heard today it's five to six years, but that's not what your boss says. Um, but let's say it's five to six years. It's a long time when people are in the community, living in the community, uh, working and kids going to school, uh, having children, uh, becoming part of the community. There is a 1.6 million person backlog now on asylum claims being considered by the courts. 1.2 million people have gone through the process and received a final order of removal, meaning they should be deported because they were not successful in their asylum claim. And yet the administration has reduced the number of people uh, being deported. It's now 56,000 a year. That's about 4 percent. In the Obama-Biden uh, Obama years, it was 350,000 a year. Incidentally, under law, Section 235 of the Immigration Nationality Act, there is a requirement for detention of unlawful migrants seeking asylum crossing our border without authorization. And yet, of course, we don't have the cap capacity to do that. This administration has reduced the number of ICE beds. We're now at 24,000 beds, much of which are already full. So that's where we are, and that's why it's true, I think, that there is a consensus here on this panel that this is broken. We have to fix it. On the illegal narcotics coming over, uh, Agent, I appreciate the work that your folks do. I was at Mariposo, the port of entry near Nogales earlier this year, saw the desperate need for more of these scanning devices you talked about to try to stop the fentanyl. The fentanyl is streaming in to our communities. It's coming in at such high volumes now that it's reducing the price because of supply and demand, a lot, huge supply, very inexpensive, and it is causing more deaths as a result. Uh, I'm a big fan of looking at the demand side. I've passed legislation and it's working now on treatment and recovery and prevention, but it's impossible to deal with this flood and not have many more people dying of overdoses. We're at record levels right now. Here's the numbers that we have. Only 2% of passenger vehicles are being scanned. Only 17% of commercial vehicles are being scanned. That's it. And yet that's where 90% of the seizures attributed to non-intrusive inspections uh, are resulting from. So this is where we're finding most of these narcotics. It's a huge increase in March, a huge increase from the last uh, pre previous March, 300 percent increase from the previous March. It's at levels we've never seen before. And yet, think of all those trucks and cars that we're not scanning. So the question, Agent Huffman, is you know, how can we do better? There's a plan to increase that by the end of next year. And yet I look at the President's budget this year, there's zero in the budget for new scanning machines. So I guess my question for you is, are we on track at least to reach this number of 40 percent of passenger vehicles instead of 2 percent and 70 percent of commercial vehicles instead of 17 percent by the end of next year? Yes, sir, we are on track. Oh, sorry. We are, we are on track by the end of FY23 to, be, uh, to increase the scans, to scan uh, 40 percent of vehicles and, and, the, uh, and the 72 percent of the commercial commercial vehicles, uh, respectively. And, and as you know, we certainly like to do more, and as we in, in, increase our ability to do so, we will do that. It's, 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 it's key that we're able to look at, obviously we'd like to look at every single thing that comes into the country if we have the ability to do that, because it's important to do that. And, and there's no question that fentanyl is a significant threat to us. We provided the funding for you back in uh, 2019 to, to get to that number of 40 percent at least of cars, 70 percent of trucks, and we should provide more. But again, in the budget, there's nothing on unaccompanied kids. Uh, Senator also talked about this. Kids have been mistreated in the past, as we know. There's lots of stories about it, unfortunately. I got involved in this because of a bunch of kids from Guatemala. Six of them were brought up by their trafficker, went into HHS custody, then HHS gave them to sponsors. Those sponsors were the traffickers, the very traffickers who have treated, had treated them so uh, poorly coming up from the border, uh, lied to their parents, and they took them to an egg farm in Ohio where six kids, as young as 14, lived in deplorable situations, uh, underpaid, working six, seven days a week, not in school, and luckily a local authority found it. And this is one thing that got the interest of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations with this committee. Senator Carper and I did 
uh, intensive investigation. We've published three reports about it and basically about the failure of the federal agencies to be responsible for the care of our unaccompanied kids. Um, so, Ms. Contreras, uh, I don't have time to get into this in the detail. I'd like to, but as you know, uh, we've done a lot of work in this area. We think it is totally unacceptable for the U.S. government to release unaccompanied kids who are by definition much more vulnerable to trafficking to unrelated sponsors and, and not to do more follow-up. Uh, right now, we are told that there is no follow-up after three phone calls and that we don't know where 19,000 unaccompanied kids are. We cannot determine their safety and well-being. Is that correct? Senator, thank you for that question and thank you for your leadership on making sure that we keep our duty to children and, and that includes post-release. Uh, what I would like to share is that the work that has been done to strengthen the post-release work, um, some of which you referred to, with which are well-being follow-up calls. Uh, there are home visits in place now if there are concerns raised. Uh, the, the background checks and vetting that happens for sponsors is designed specifically to avoid the kinds of um, problems that have happened. We take the safety of kids very seriously. It's the number one priority, and we keep building on what our duties are, how do we carry out those duties to build up that post-release support as well to make sure that they are in safe hands. Well, there's a, a continuing issue, as you know, as to who has responsibility, and my hope is that HHS, uh, under your leadership, takes additional responsibility for these kids. Someone's got to be responsible for their care. Um, let me ask you a very specific question uh, as my final question, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> HHS has cooperated with some of our requests for information. We continue to do oversight on this issue, as you know, but we have yet to receive uh, re documents that we have requested, and these were requested in January uh, in a letter to uh, HHS Secretary Javier Becerra. Can you commit to ensuring that HHS sends the remaining documents uh, by the end of next week? Senator, you do have my commitment that we'll go back and get the attention of who I need to to figure out what it is that that we owe you and how we can make sure that we follow up as okay. promptly as we can. I'll tell you what it can. is. It's very simple. It's the number of sponsors out there, the number of sponsors who have been denied, information that you would have, and it's not information that, uh, you know, is difficult, I wouldn't think, to, to find and very necessary for us to do the proper oversight. So I really appreciate your getting those to us by next week so that we can continue our oversight work. And again, to each of you, thank you for your service, and particularly to those of you representing people on the border itself, uh, you have an impossible task. Thank you for what you do every day. Uh, the American people are asking a lot of you, and I know it's very stressful, and I know there's been a difficulty in retention and, and, um, and recruitment, and um, we need to do everything we can to, to hold, um, Agent, your people up right now, because uh, it's hard already, and it's about to get a whole lot harder, and we owe them not just better policy in the administration, but better legislating, and, and we will continue to work on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.